All right, team. Our knockoff game systems aren't selling like they used to. We need fresh ideas or this company is doomed. A new handheld that plays all the same games our other systems do, but needs a TV to be used. And it's shaped like Sonic the Hedgehog's head. Well, isn't Sonic the Hedgehog Sega's mascot? And it's also a flashlight. Well, from some of the greatest bootlegging minds of our generation, we have a console that has more brand confusion than Justin Bieber at an old age home. This is the MGP Slim Station number 8. It features laser lamps, flashlight, TV game, and car gifts. Uh, it claims to be a Sega Mega Drive, which I can assure you it ain't. And it promises super classic game. We got Sonic the Hedgehog endorsing it. And we've got SpongeBob as well. And Super Mario. And Plants vs. Zombies. And the bottom claims it's got a gift TV game flashlight laser. So it's a 4 in 1 gift game flashlight laser. On the back, there's more brand confusion <laughs> as we bring in Super Mario, Angry Birds, Banjo Kazooie, and Plants vs. Zombies. It claims that it's got some 3D on it. Probably not. And we've also got more SpongeBob and Despicable Me up there. There's a minion riding a dinosaur. With all this type of endorsement, how could we possibly go wrong? Well, let's crack into it and find out. So it's being held together with top-of-the-line staples. And that... I don't know if the camera does that justice, but the actual blue paint job on that is just terrible. It looks like they went to a hardware store, bought a can of the cheapest blue spray paint that they could, gave it a quick once over, and called it a day. They've conveniently taken the battery out of it, or the screw out of the battery container though, so that'll make it much easier for us to put the battery in later. Yeah, and inexplicably, they've decided, hey, this little handheld that we've designed also needs a built-in flashlight. The analog stick feels okay. Um, there's some friction on the grip. The B and A buttons, well, since we know that this is some sort of Famiclum, having the B and A buttons directly on top of each other, well, it's going to take a little bit of getting used to, and I don't know what the T button's for, but maybe it's using the T-Blade in Mega Man? They like Mega Man so much they gave it its own button? The plastic's okay, it doesn't feel like it's going to disintegrate immediately upon use. It feels like it could take being thrown at the wall once or twice, which is probably a good thing considering how bad the controller layout seems to be. And I just so happen to have a AAA battery right here. There's a little red LED that goes on there to let you know that you in fact do have power. Well, I think we might have to crack into the manual to find out how the flashlight on this works, assuming it does work. Go ahead and close that back up. Also in the box, we have a set of AV cables. We will be needing those later. Oh, look, they're being true to the original Nintendo. They've got yellow and red instead of yellow and white. That's, uh, that's attention to detail, boys. Let's see here. It's got three fire buttons plus one multi-function the direction key. Super classic games in one set. TV output interface. AV cable included. Supported TV system and TSE. Built-in laser lamps. Built-in flashlight. And it's powered by a single AAA. Hmm. I think that's it for in terms of the instructions we get. Oh, there's only so many buttons on this thing. I generally do not know how to turn on that flashlight. Oh, well, we didn't buy it for the flashlight anyways. Let's plug it in and see how it does. 
Okay, so we turn this thing on, and holy crap, is that supposed to be Sonic the Hedgehog? Anyways, every time we start this thing up, we're going to be prompted to uh, enter which language we want to be playing in. And we're going to select English because I don't speak Chinese. So here's the main menu. A lot of what we've seen before. And Super Mario is the first thing we're going to jump into. Now right off the bat, you can tell that the sound is a little off. Um, it seems to be using an older version of the Nintendo on a chip, the ones that we saw in the Power Arcade and the other Power Joy systems released years and years ago. Now here for comparison is some video ripped from the NES Classic clone we tested out a few weeks ago. And some footage from a bootleg card played on the original NES. So as you can see, the audio is inferior on this new handheld system compared to, obviously, the original NES, but also to the NES Classic clone that we tested a few weeks ago. In addition, none of the video quality is the same between the three of them, and the colors are slightly off between them. That also highlights one of the other problems I've run into with this system. Jostling it too much or wiggling the wire causes there to be audio-video interference on the screen, and if you've got a child that's playing with it that's particularly excitable, they're going to have a bad time. Alright, time to reset and try something different, and again we have to specify which language we want to play in. Back to English, and I think this time we'll jump into the Contra menu. So much like the other systems we've seen, this has a submenu for all the different versions of Contra, which are essentially just Contra with different options. We'll go ahead and jump into one player mode and we'll see how it plays. Okay, so right off the bat I can say that obviously this gamepad isn't as good as the original NES controller, but it's not as bad as the one on the clone. Um, I will say that down on the so-called analog stick, doesn't work that well. Uh, aiming down, especially when jumping and shooting, doesn't work particularly well with this controller. Okay, I think next we're gonna give this Angry Bird 3 game a shot, see how it plays. Well, it certainly does seem to be an NES uh, version of Angry Birds. The options are limited, you don't have control over the power as far as I can tell, uh, only the angle. And uh, the number of angles you can pick from is pretty limited. And it was at this point that I realized that 90% of the shots in this game can actually be completed with the exact same angle and have the same effect. In fact, I cleared three or four levels just by completely repeating that shot over and over and over again. I decided to give Arkanoid a shot next. Uh, it played as well as you would expect. The analog stick doesn't seem to be as responsive as the D-pad in this particular situation, so I found that the paddle almost seemed a little bit lagging behind. Of course, this could also be due to my capture hardware, but it just didn't seem to play quite right, which was a little bit disappointing because I thought the gliding sort of PSP-style analog stick was going to be a good match for this game. Tetris played just fine in this particular configuration. Not a lot to go wrong with Tetris as long as the controller works, and in this case it does. It 
It was at this point I made an interesting discovery. Intrigued by Aladdin 3, I fired it up only to find that it's Adventure Island. As I poked around the handheld later on, I found that a lot of the games on here are actually just Adventure Island. Some of them are just repeats, while other ones will start you further on in the game. Nineteen Forty Two was a game that I had high hopes for, and it didn't disappoint. Using the fake analog stick on it worked quite well, making it a little bit closer to the arcade experience. I had a similar experience playing Galaga using these controls as well. as well as with Sky Destroyer. A version of Dig Dug ended up on here. Mm, sort of. All of the characters that have been switched to turtle shells and cars and... I can't even tell what all of them are supposed to be to be honest. And it looks like Adventure Island isn't the only game to be split up. Yes, poor Circus Charlie has all of his levels accessible right from the main menu. So what's the final verdict here? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. The controller is small and gets uncomfortable after extended play, the paint quality leaves a bit to be desired, and the included AV cable causes a bit of static if it's jostled around too much. The build quality of the case, however, is pretty solid. The directional stick is alright, but it doesn't translate to all games equally. It does turn out, however, that the included flashlight does work. You see, what you have to do is you have to turn the unit on, remove the AV cable, and then press left on the analog stick, and the light goes on and off. Overall, at a purchase price of just over $8 Canadian, it's not a bad investment and I think you can at least get $8 worth of entertainment out of it. If you'd like to purchase one, I've gone ahead and tossed a link to the AliExpress page I bought it from in the video description below. Thanks so much for sticking around until the end of the video. If you liked the video, why not toss me a thumbs up? If you're new here, you can subscribe and don't forget to click the bell so you'll be notified when I put out new content. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so you can find those on the About section of my YouTube page. If you've got something you want to look at in the future, go ahead and let me know in the comments below. And until next time, stay creative.